This is Dom Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcasts that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 100. Oi! Don't be scared. All of this is new to you and new can be scary. When people need help, I never refuse. There's this moment when you're sure you're about to die, and then you're born. I know exactly who I am. I'm the doctor. Ta-da! Ooh. Should be fine. Woohoo! Woohoo! I am Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where for the past 100 episodes, we've been discussing everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. Uh, and for many more, we hope, with your uh, continued help and support and patronage and listenership. Uh, today we're discussing Kerblam, uh, which just seems like very festive for our 100th episode. Yeah. So Ker- Kerblam. Joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Hey, well, gentlemen, thank you for making it to 100 episodes uh, with me here on The Secrets of Doctor well, Who. It's been a long <laughs> slog, you know, you just <laughs> slaving over the microphones to get here. I remember I our, our very first episode was the first Peter Capaldi episode, so we've yes, been at this a while. It was, yes. I mean, what two two seasons, but like five years or something. Well, I think it's four years actually. Uh, is is more like it, but uh, yeah. So uh, and you know, of course, uh, you know, I can, it, it it almost goes without saying, but it won't go without saying that uh, it's due to the listenership, uh, people who have been uh, listening to this show, either one episode or all one hundred episodes. It's due to your listenership that we're able to keep going on, and we really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and um, and and maybe I just want to add a, a you know a little bit onto that. Uh, we need your support to continue to do that uh, to make it to two hundred or more episodes. I mean, there's so much Doctor Who out there that uh, you know there's there's at least another hundred episodes worth, uh, and probably a lot more. Uh, but if we're gonna keep doing that, we need your help. Uh, if you could go to sqpn.com/slash/give and become a patron like some of your uh some of your fellow listeners have uh your we need your patronage we need your support uh to continue to to do this um it it, it takes a lot of it's it's a lot of resources actually more than you than you realize uh to to make a show to keep it going to do it consistently like we have um we just spent a half hour talking about our schedule uh for this and and how how we're going to get this done uh, going into the new year and beyond our plans mm-hmm. Uh, for this show, for other shows like Secrets of Star Trek and Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, shows we've got in the planning stages. But for any of that to happen, we need your support by the end of the year. We really do. I mean, we need it. We need it right away uh, because um, if we, if you know, just to be quite honest, if we don't get your support, we're going to have to stop. Uh, you know, we're gonna, we're just not going to be able to keep going. So we really, uh, really need your support right now. If you can go to sqpn.com/give. Um, if you uh, make a, 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 a either a one-time donation or to or uh, a, an ongoing donation, and for if you give it particular levels, we have some nice gifts for you, including some nice Doctor Who gifts that uh, Jimmy uh, picked out for our uh, donors. So please go check it out. Um, think about it uh, and and act now if you can, please, uh, to 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 celebrate our 100th episode with a, a nice uh, patronage a gift at sqpn.com/give. Another way you can help support us is to remember to like The Secrets of Doctor Who on Facebook, uh, retweet our episodes on Twitter, leave us comments, subscribe to the show. If you're not subscribed to the show, subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or on YouTube, where you can hit the bell on YouTube to make sure you get notifications when we post new episodes there. And then share the podcast with your friends. Help us grow our community, reach more listeners. We'd like to double our listenership by the time we get to episode 150 we'd like you know we want to and there's so much going on with doctor who and maybe we could talk about that now before we get into discussing Kerblam. there's some news out some uh, good news so mm-hmm. maybe some not so 
good news that might be just more of a rumor. But uh, but guys, there's, there's some good news. Yeah. Well, the first the first thing, and <clears throat> I forget if we've mentioned this on the show before, but this year we're not having a Christmas episode of Doctor Who. It's going to be a New Year's Day episode, mm-hmm. right? And to me, that's a sensible change because, I mean, I'd like it to be on Christmas just for whatever reason, but um, right. but I think the argument is plausible that they've kind of mined out Christmas. And the and I'd rather not have them try to shoehorn Christmas into an episode just to make it Christmassy. I'd rather just have a nice, fun story. And so apparently mm-hmm. that's what they're going to try to do for us on New Year's Day. Yeah. Yes, th- that's the first uh, the first bit of news. I mean, the last couple have only been even tangentially related. Uh, the Twice Upon a Time and the Return of uh, Dr. Mysterio, Mysterio. Yeah. have not even really been. They've been only sort of sort of related to Christmas. Now, the, the rumor does have it, or the, the story that uh, we're talking about for coming for the future of Doctor Who does say that 2019 will very likely be a Christmas episode again. Oh, interesting. Um, but, the, that, that, but that's the part of the news, though. In 2019, we will have Doctor Who. So no more season. gap year. Correct. There was a rumor for a while that there was going to be another gap year, and in 2020 was going to be the next season of Doctor Who. But it, they've, BBC has definitively, definitively stated that they are already in production of 2019's season, season 12. Yeah. So that's good so news. That's, that's the good news. Then there's a bit of news that maybe not so good, that's sort of a rumor, which is that... Well, um, no, it is a rumor. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I shouldn't equivocate. It's a rumor that Chris Chibnall is unhappy with the idea of producing another season in 2019, and he may uh, leave the show after that, um, and even do an abbreviated season of just five or six episodes instead of the full 10 yeah. or, or so. And to, there's the fair, rumor that if he goes, Jody Whitaker will go too. Yeah. And if to, Jody goes, then the companions would yeah. go. To be fair, we've heard this before. Yes. Uh, we'd hear this with Stephen Moffat, heard this with uh, Russell T. Davies. It was all, you know, there was always, this, at best, this is just a bargaining chip. Chip. You know, you give me what I want or Wait, I leave. I want a bargaining chimp, actually. Yeah, that. actually. <laughs> that's, I've heard they do good work. <laughs> Is that like the Better Trump than the monkey? robots. No. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A trunk monkey, right. Uh, uh. But yes, it, it gets very much, very, it's very possible and pro- maybe even probable that it's part of the whole uh, process of uh, TV production. Give uh, me more if, money or I walk. If it's yeah. anything at all, it may be just total rumorness. And I mean, there's right. so many rumors out there in fandom that just have no basis at all. Just someone trolling late at night comes up with the rumors. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, right. Let's rattle the Doctor Who fan cages. It's like, guess what? Chris Chibnall and Jodie Whittaker are leaving. And, you know, and it could be absolutely nothing. Right. My, my cousin's <laughs> second neighbor, house housewives, <laughs> nephews, roommate said that he heard from their cousins, nephews, housewives. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the 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 one thing is is you know if it were to happen you know however you feel about Jody and about Chris Chibnall and you know and th- this season uh, upheaval is not good for the show you know in in such a short period of time uh, we got we got actually we traded up after Christopher Eccleston <laughs> yeah. that's right that's right so it's it, it's true it's true but and, and the, but the sh- it probably wasn't good for the show even then the after that first season return to have that sort of upheaval though i mean there was there was that i think it probably made people nervous and mm-hmm. uh, you know i, I uh, personally i kind of like jody whitaker i like what she's doing and i uh, and frankly i love i like the com- uh, companions I, graham mm-hmm. might be one of my favorite companions oh yeah uh, but uh, and I'd hate to see him go. And, and in fact, in this episode, it gets even a little better. So let's so let's table the rumor. You know, we'll see if any new actual news come out. We'll we'll talk about it. But for now, uh, let's just celebrate that there's going to be a, a more new Doctor Who in 2019, more than just a, a Christmas episode. And that's good news. So. All right. Kerblam, uh, which is the, the we didn't. Did we get a uh, a year or century on this? No. Just oh, okay, so, anonymous future. So at some point in the future, the Amazon of the future is a company yeah, called this, Kerblam. This mm-hmm. is Jeff Bezos' wildest dream made real. <laughs> yeah. Although, I mean, yeah, 
I want the, I want the teleporting, you know, uh, robots <laughs> that bring you your product immediately instead of having to wait, you know, for UPS to deliver it in two days. Two, two days. What are you talking about? I need immediate <laughs> gratification. Exactly. In, in some cities in America, you can get Amazon Prime now. That's literally yeah. what it's called. Where it's with, 30 with, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it, that's theoretically available in my area, but I've never ordered anything that qualified for that. So I've never actually gotten yeah. anything that fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I want to pay the premium, but uh, I mean, who knows what the teleportation would be uh, when they get the drones that we can come back. In fact, that's twirly. sort of what. Yeah. Well, I was going to say twirly was kind of the drone delivery. In fact, let's let's kind of talk about how the 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 episode sort of. The, the subtext of our contemporary yeah. society plays in this, which is there's been lots of talk over the last few years about about Amazon, Amazon taking over retail, driving brick and mortar stores mm -hmm. out of business. Amazon makes everything, sells everything, uh, sort of sucks up the retail space. But then also there have been news stories about how Amazon well, treats its employees in the warehouses poorly. Uh, well, and more broadly than that, there, people have been losing their jobs to robots for decades now. And right. this, this is, is just exactly an acceleration new... of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a, a future where people are apparently living in a post scarcity society so that you don't really need a job and you can still afford to order things from Kablam. So this right. is post scarcity, because otherwise, if people needed jobs to order things, then Ker Kerblam right. would go out of business. So right. obviously people have enough wealth. They don't have to have a job, but it's ennobling to have one. And so they mm -hmm. have this labor movement to get at least 10 percent employment. Does that, that's actually a nice uh, part of it, which is that uh, this idea that there is nobility. There is there's something in human nature that we need that, that labor uh, gives right. us, uh, you know, um, yeah. Uh, elevates us. It, it, and that's also yeah. something that's very clear in the teaching of the church, that work is inherently ennobling. It's part of what we're here to do. Right, right. And just not sitting around like in uh, Wally, uh, sitting in our, uh, our reclining chairs, getting uh, fatter and fatter while we play well, video that, games. And that's interesting because, of course, we live in a society that's very utilitarian as far as that's concerned. It's just your job is to make money. You give your time to your employer to make money so that you can buy the goods that you need and want and desire. Right. And, you know, we're, we are in a, con a consumerist society where, you know, as as we see, you know, we're, we're recording this uh, the week of Thanksgiving 2018. And so we have uh, Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, Cyber Monday, uh, they, they there's Giving Tuesday, and like I said at the top of the show, giving is a good thing for for, yes. for that. But uh, uh, so you give back a little bit, and in the midst of all the mass consumption, uh, mm -hmm. we just had like a was a, there was a Singles Day, which is I think comes out of China, which is a big big thing. Like people uh, are encouraged to buy something for themselves, all the Ooh. singles, because you don't because you don't buy enough for yourself the rest of the year. But like so, we're in a consumerist society, whereas um the, you know the and the, the idea of Work in itself being good for you, you know, even, uh, you know, that that a life without work is doesn't have meaning uh, and work of various kinds, not just work on a assembly line, which is fine, but but all kinds of work. Yeah. And so let's let's talk about one thing that um, that they did in this episode connected with this theme work on an assembly line, which I am not a fan of. Yeah, I've worked I've worked, you know, menial jobs. I used to be a dishwasher. In fact, I like Graham's reference uh because as a janitor in this, he was working with cleaning products and yep. and the doctor says at one point, you're in a perfect position to find this out for us and he says, "Yeah, and I've got chronic skin irritation." And yeah. I actually <laughs> I got chronic skin irritation from being a dishwasher. Oh, yeah. uh, I couldn't put on latex gloves for years without my hands breaking out because mm -hmm. I'd worn them so much. Um, so I totally sympathize with that. I've done a lot of low paying jobs in the past. And um, and so, you know, they're not always the funnest jobs, but Ryan was is constantly complaining about them and about work. Mm -hmm. And. If I were Chris Chibnall, I wouldn't have so much complaining. They did the same thing when Rose was on the show, and she would right. diss ordinary life and just work Being in a, a shop, shop and, and stuff yeah. like that. And it's like, come on, guys. Work is ennobling. Even if it's not the best job, don't talk about people 
in these positions as if their work is meaningless. It's not. Right. Well, in one way, it's it, it perpetuates a stereotype about millennials. It's not really that fair. I mean, there's all this this the, the this stereotypes of millennials as being lazy or stupid or whatever, mm -hmm. which isn't fair. I mean, millennials are like any other generation. There's a vast gamut of attitudes uh, and abilities, uh, you know, in it. And I know plenty of millennials who are hard workers and, and, and all that. But it sort of perpetuates this stereotype with Ryan, who doesn't, you know, who, who he, he, he does kind of complain about his menial jobs. Menial, I mean, sure, that's one of the things that being a young person often results in. If you, you, you start, you start at the somewhere. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, whereas Yaz, who is the same age, by the way, is a, yeah. is a police officer. She's a PC, right? Is that what you call it in, in Britain? A, P, a, a police constable? Something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I please like, uh, correct me online. <laughs> yeah. I, I like. I liked. By the way, in the same scene where uh, Ryan is talking down what they're doing, the guest character Kira yes. is explaining her view of things and says, "You know, essentially, we're making people happy when people yep. get these packages. They love to open them, which is true. People love right. to open packages they get in the mail." And I mean, there are even songs about it. I remember growing up, oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming round the bend, uh, you know, it, it <laughs> celebrating packages arriving in the mail. And yeah. um, and and the doctor turns to Kira and says, Kira, you have a great approach to life. And yes. I thought, yes, Kira does. You know, and to I, work. I just I just I just had a I had a thought, though, um, I, to kind of disagree a little bit with the beginning where we kind of starting this conversation about work. I think we do see that there is, it isn't completely a post scarcity worldview because you've got Dan who's working down in the, the sorting area where he's picking up the items. He's talking about how the money is going to take care of his daughter. Mm -hmm, you've got right. Kira who talks about how she never got a gift because she was an orphan. So there are still people who need to work for money. Right. In this culture. Yeah, well yeah, I think it's I think it's a balance. There's also a tendency, and we see this in our own culture, to have your horizons expand as the economy expands. So mm -hmm. even people who are on who are you know on welfare today are vastly rich compared to any prior yes. century. Yes. And so this the same thing you know would would presumably be true in this future. So mm -hmm. the daughter who he's yeah. working for may be, as rich as an interstellar empress from our perspective. <laughs> right. The, uh, the, the, the poorest, uh, American is in the 10%, uh, in the middle ages, for, for instance, uh, that sort of the thing. The 1%. Well, even, even, even throughout yeah. the world, there are, there are places in the world today that, you know, the poorest American looks rich compared to them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so let's, let's go back to the, to the start, uh, the, 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 the TARDIS is flying through the time vortex um, and they're being chased by something. It turns out it's a teleport beam, and it's the Kerblam Man, which the Doctor recognizes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and she, I love the Kerblam Man, she says. I love the fact she loves the Kerblam Man, because this yeah. is, I mean, this is, you would ordinarily think, ooh, the Doctor is going to be immediately suspicious of this thing. It's a corporate thing. It's a robot. It looks kind of creepy. Right. And, and so you would kind of expect her to be opposed. It's also a commercial thing. And given the trajectory of the show recently, you right. would think, oh, we're going to have this big anti-corporate, anti-Amazon statement. And we don't get that. No. Right. Um, in which fact, was in the end, made, it turns out, turns it on its head. Yeah. That it, expectation. It was, it was, it was a very refreshing episode from exactly. that perspective. Exactly. And uh, she gets a package that's been delayed. Apparently it's been ch chasing her all over time and space. Uh, and it's a fez. Yeah, uh, which she must have <laughs> Matt, ordered when she was Matt Smith. Matt Smith <laughs> reference. <laughs> so that's a very the slow service. She hopes yeah. she gets her uh, an Amazon Prime credit. I'm sorry, yeah. Blame Prime. <laughs> and we, you know, we, I, we I also love, uh, in, incidentally love, we also we also get a David Tennant uh, reference because later when they're talking about wasps, she says, yes. "Did I ever tell you about me and Agatha Christie?" Which is <laughs> a reference to the unicorn and the oh, wasp, yeah. one of the David Tennant yes. episodes. Yes, well, I, I love I love Ryan because he. Was he is excited about bubble wrap? Bubble wrap, mm -hmm. which which is a little bit it of foreshadowing. Yeah, yes. uh, but, I mean, we're all like that. You know, again, you talk about getting a package. How many of us, when we get a package with bubble wrap, we don't immediately start popping? Well, yeah. if you have kids, so whenever I get a package from Amazon, I like the 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 they they want to know what's in it. So we, uh, here, this is it's a spatula. I hope you're excited. Like, oh, great. 
uh, I get the box. I get the bubble wrap. I'm like, I'm not giving you presents for Christmas, kids. I'm giving you boxes and bubble wrap. <laughs> because well, there's still seems- apps out there. There's still phone apps where you can bubble pop bubble wrap. <laughs> yeah, they need someone needs to come up with a kerblam version of that. Kaboom! <laughs> where yeah. you pop it, it goes boom. R- randomly, uh, it blows up. You know, the screen yeah. turns green. Yeah, that would be actually good. That's it. Oh, that, I'll give that one away to some fun developer. That that <laughs> so she, the doctor also makes a reference uh, some about, oh, I, I think it was Ryan who said, the, he, it might have been Ryan or Graham who said that he found the robot creepy and mm-hmm. the doctor chastises him for being robophobic. The robophobic, which is a word that gets used uh, tongue in cheek uh, online in connection with uh, such things. Yes, <laughs> we won't go too far down that path. Uh, and then so they go, they get this uh, on the packing slip. It's put on the back. It says, help me. So they decide that we have to go help somebody uh, in the and, and interesting. The 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 plea to go help this person comes from a companion. And the doctor's like, should we do this? And there's sort of a consensus. We're going to yeah. do this as mm-hmm. opposed to the doctor saying that's it. now I'm going to take us Charge. to go save this person. Right. It's a it's it's more of this idea that we heard about before the season began, where the doctor and the and the companions will be more of a consensus and more of a group uh, discuss, you know, d- deciding mm-hmm. to do things, which see, is this, uh, this is where we start to see Graham kind of come out because he gets kind of that twinkle in his eye. So are we going to go help him, Doc? <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- another great Graham episode, by the way, I got to say. Uh, so they get to Kerblam. They're, they're pretending to be new employees, by the way. Uh, the CGI of the Kerblam plant, the 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 uh, on the this moon of Kandoka, uh, that mm-hmm. was the name of the planet, um, is all CGI. In fact, many of the sets are uh, completely CGI. In fact, I think the mo- they they I saw a note that said it was the most CGI set design that they've ever done. Oh, uh, I, I, I I'm guessing then that that entryway was heavily CGI in the in the Kablam offices. Mm-hmm. Um, I was impressed with the design though. I, I didn't know it was CGI and I still don't, but, but I didn't think it was CGI when I was watching it. And I thought, wow, this is an impressive set. Look at mm-hmm. all this stuff because they had like this glazed glass in the yep. background that would show the development in stages, like the ascent of man image right. you know, where we evolved right. from primates. And it shows the development of the Kablam man, from twirly all the way to the current models. Right, yep. right. And then all of the, like every, like every corporate uh, headquarters office, uh, all of the um, historical artifacts, which again, yep. nothing's wasted. Everything is is is, is used here, which is a very, very nice well, touch. And I, I didn't realize that the, the, the actual outside shot was CGI. Yep. I went actually looking yep. to see if I could figure out what what warehouse did they use? Where, as where, their... where did they go to film with the giant planet in the sky? Well, that, <laughs> that's easily CGI. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah no, yeah, that whole thing was uh, CGI. In fact, you can see in the uh, reverse shot as they're coming out of the TARDIS, it's just sky behind them. And that could have even been on a soundstage with uh, a backdrop and, and good lighting. Right. I mean, that's so this was um, in some ways a lower cost episode, although I think a lot of the money went into the Kerblam man costumes for all the extras, yeah. mm-hmm. um, that sort of thing. Um, so they so they they go to get a job at the Kerblam plant, and they meet uh, the woman who's the the head of people uh, because Judy. Kerblam Judy is uh, because Kerblam is people powered, which is again another funny turn on the head of this uh, like yeah. human resources sorts of uh, business speak. I I kept expecting it to turn out, especially I mean, even before they found the the slime pit with the yeah, so, with the group so in it. I yeah, I kept expecting this to be people powered in a whole different way with <laughs> exactly. all those power blackouts. And I thought yeah. it was an effective fake out when they went yeah. in a different yeah. direction. Well, was, Charlton was, Heston stands expecting... up on the yeah, on yeah. the on the rack and goes, "Kerblam is people." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was expecting you know to Judy to be kind of the the the, the sinister. You know, oh, she looks all pleasant and bubbly yes. and happy, but she's really yeah. the under, you know, the the spearhead of this and under e- this evil empire. It, even more so when they introduce Jarvis Slade with a name yes. like yeah. Slade, and he's totally unsympathetic in the beginning, and he turns out to be a good guy too. And I yep. loved all right. of the subversion of standard tropes they had in this episode. I, just to lay my cards on the table, this for me was the funnest episode we've had this yeah. season. Yes. It just, oh, I, agree. I 
it 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 avoided and even subverted all kinds of cliches, including ones that have been on the show lately. Yeah. I just thought this was a, just a what I had been waiting for a and nice the, the, fun romp. And the, the yeah. cartoon style conveyor belt chase really yes. yeah. helped a lot. I love that. Right out of uh, Toy Story two, I think it was uh, the, or, toy, well, the, the this luggage. Goes all the way back to yeah. like yeah. Disney and Looney Tunes. I mean, well, sure. Th- this yeah, kind of thing, right. and you know, and I love. Or, uh, I was in thinking the, Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. It's like an underground yeah. roller coaster. Um, well, yeah. You know, one, one thing with, with that scene that I loved um, remind me of the game Portal. They go, you know, they're going through the conveyor belt, and then they're going into yeah. that chute where there's the organic, de- uh, organic infection detected, or whatever it was. <laughs> yes. And And there was the uh, worker or the the quarantine chute. It w- where it was the lasers, laser quarantine, <laughs> laser quarantine yeah. shoot. That sounded right out of Portal. If you ever played yes. the Portal video games, that sounded yes, right the, out of that. Well, well, again, that plays into the subversion of the trope, where you think it's the AI is the enemy, is the bad guy, anti-human. Mm-hmm. This was the uh, the setup is that the that we we're supposed to get is that Kerblam is automated, and all the robots are being controlled by an a a a, 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 a hostile AI. That's going to trying to exterminate human beings. And that's what we're set up for. That's the trope. That's the. the and what it is, yeah. is it's all turned on its head. It's the AI is the one that's in trouble and asking for help. And it's exactly. the, uh, you know, you know yeah. spoilers, of course. It's the it's the the custodian that nobody's Charlie, the nice guy. Who Turns out to be a terrorist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, and it, it's they, they they did kind of foreshadow that where Graham's complaining about the fact that he got swapped in as janitor because the doctor was supposed to be the janitor originally. Right, I know that would have been great. I, uh, I love well, how the how the AI sussed out that the role the doctor is best suited for is scrubbing floors. I mean, that's, exactly, that's something you would not have expected. But but then you know <laughs> she mentions to Graham is you're in the perfect position because no one pays attention to the cleaning person. Yeah, right. You well, just and in fact. Him. The doctor being made a janitor might might have been the AI saying, you know, because the doctor sent the help me to the, I mean, the, the AI sent the help me to the doctor. So right. this was the, the AI pointing the doctor at the guy who's doing it, uh, exactly. which was the janitor. And mm-hmm. then the doctor subverts that by by sending Graham in her, in her place. By, by the way, Jodie Whittaker, this would not have been the first time the doctor has been both a woman and a janitor because... Uh, there's an episode back in the third doctor's time where John Pertwee's doctor, oh, in order right. to in order to break into a facility, <laughs> yeah. becomes a cleaning woman. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's what I have seen. Yes. <laughs> so there is a, a, a scene where uh, the doctor finally goes in and confronts Slade and uh, what was her name? Judy. Janet. Judy. Judy. I, I, I didn't, forgot to write it down. So Slade and Judy, and she she basically accused them. Look, you you may be behind this. You may be the the, the evil people making these workers go missing. Uh, sorry, I I skipped the part where um, Dan, the very nice guy Dan, who's got a daughter that he's he doesn't get to see, but who's working very hard to support. He befriends Yaz, and when Yaz gets a uh, a, a message to go you know, a pick order down in the the vast subterranean areas of the warehouse. He says, not on your first day. I'll go in your, in your place. Last and Dan person ends, who did that disappeared. Right. And then Dan yeah. ends up disappearing. Um, and so the doctor and uh, Ryan and Yaz, who, you know, the doctor, the doctor and Ryan have been working in, in uh, packaging. Uh, they, they go into the office and they confront Ju- uh, Judy and Slade. And the doctor kind of goes at them and, I will bring you down. I am the doctor. And which is that grandiose sort of, oh, yeah. you know, demands and, and, and threats. But then she kind of dials it back a little on the way out going, was that too bombastic? That might've been too bombastic. Like, yeah, <laughs> it sort of undermines that whole thing. Like Capaldi never would have wondered if he was, if he was too much uh, yeah. on the way out. Uh, yeah. So that's good. Um, but so I really like to set up that, you know, Dan, wonderful guy. Kira, you know, lovely person. Like, so the human mm-hmm. beings that they've met so far, apart from Slade, are really nice people. Charlie, um, you yeah, know, I will, he, I will see he has that awkward though. love, awkward I, fall in love with I, Kira thing. I, I know there's a, there's a great moment where he's talking to uh, to uh, Graham and and and. And Graham is like pointed out, look, dude, you're in love with her. You need to act on that. (laughs) And and Charlie is like, have have you have you smelt her? And Graham says, (laughs) oddly enough, I haven't. 
<laughs> I have to say, Brad, Brad Walsh had a chance to, to, to pull some of his uh, comedic chops out here in yeah. this one. Another time, Charles like, I've been alone here a long time. And Graham says, I can tell. <laughs> you know, one thing with, with going back to, to Dan, you know, I mean, isn't that like the war trope? You've got the guy who's got the picture of his girlfriend or the picture of his daughter. And yes. of course, he's the first to die. Yeah, yeah right, I know right. that that's that's the most tropey we get in this episode is that they that's just a straight through line on that trope. They don't do anything to subvert it. He's right. the tragic sacrifice to show us the danger. Yep. And, and uh, you know, we, we actually do get I think it's Judy who says at one point work gives us purpose. I mean, she mm-hmm. really they, they 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 put that out there, the, the importance of work. Um, and then we were constantly confronted with the question. What's what's the problem here? Is it the people or the technology? And we're going back mm-hmm. and forth, back and forth. Um, we and get eventually to- the problem is resolved as being the people, but one in particular, <laughs> one in particular. But right. they there's a bit that they don't pay off, which is the so the system has been fighting back against Charlie's plan, right? And this, and there's this, and and we don't know it's exactly what's happening at at the at, in all of this, but but um, Kira, who has only gotten one gift in her life, and it made her so overjoyed just to get a box of chocolates for Christmas from her boss at work, yes. um, is then told she's been designated employee of the day, and Kerblam has a gift for her, and knowing what that's going to mean to her. And then they take her down to the room in the down below and give her a box to open. And you can just see her face light up as she's opening the box. And we, the viewer, know this is going to be hideously cruel. Yes. And 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 it's just so poignant knowing what getting a gift means to this person. And she opens the box and it's empty except for bubble wrap. And it's so cruel and it's so poignant. And we don't yet know what the significance of the bubble wrap is. But then she pops a bubble and kerblam and she dies. And it, mm-hmm. and we're later told by the doctor that was the system trying to get Charlie to realize what it would feel like to have someone you care about die in a bubble wrap explosion. And right. so this was so the system killed Kira in order to yes, in order to try to stop a bigger disaster but still the system killed Kira and they never addressed yeah. that. This is, this well, is a rogue AI. This is, this is, this was my, my the, what I disliked about this episode. I, re, I enjoyed the episode for the most part, mm-hmm. uh, but, but sometimes Dr. Who in general has this thing of pointless deaths of nice people. Like right. let's make the nicest people you can imagine. And so that when they die in pointless ways, you'll feel even worse, you know, and, you know, could sort of amp up the drama, but w- but when when people die for to, to just advance a plot point, I'm sorry, that's not I mean, that's horrible. I just don't like that. I don't like TV shows where people you you set up these nice people to die as a as a, a you know, just as a sort of part of the plot. And then we move on and then we sort of just, oh, yeah. this not that bad. And we, well, I, we I, need I, we need to pay it off on the back end and say, OK, Charlie was not the only thing broken here. The A.I. is broken, too, well, because you know. and we've got to fix this A.I. Well, right. when we talked about um, the the TV series The Good Place, and we talked about the episode where they had the trolley, the trolley scenario, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And basically, the AI's answer to the trolley scenario is, "Well, I'll just kill kill the one," right? Which is you know. what, yeah, exactly. And you you can't, from a moral standpoint, you just can't, you can't just kill somebody to make a point. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. I mean that that's the problem with the AI is it had the ability to and 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 did kill someone in order to to kind of prove a point, yeah. and that's just. Yeah. I mean, especially I mean, it's it's all it would be awful if if Kira had been the worst person in, in the world it, it, and it killed her to make a point. But it well, makes and, it feel and, even worse. And I think she was so nice. Yeah, I didn't even mind the fact. I mean, speaking from a dramatic perspective, um, I felt for her so much knowing yeah. how much this gift right. means to her and how it's going to go horribly wrong. And and that I mean, I don't mind the the writers milking my emotions in that way. That's part of drama. What I do mind is not paying it off on the other end and just right. moving on as if it didn't matter as much as it did matter. Right. Yeah. The I, I feel like Doctor Who for some sometimes every life is precious. 
Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like they, they, they every, every single person who, 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 who could die. It's, it's a horrible. And as, the times, 11, as the 11th doctor said, I never met anyone who wasn't important. Who, right. right. And then other times it feels like, oh, that sucks. Let's move on. I mean, it's just, I think the show can be inconsistent sometimes about that sort of thing. And, and, yeah. and I don't know. It, I'm, Mor- I'm a soft morality, a at, morality at the level of plot. Yeah. Yes. I, I uh, thought, I thought that was one of two flaws in this episode, two, two notable flaws. I mean, there were, you could pick on all kinds of little things, sure, but, sure. but the other flaw was how this episode, and I think it's not just this episode, but how this episode handled Ryan. Mm. Ryan is not, he started out as kind of our main window companion yes, to learn about the other companions in the world of the Doctor. But I think Ryan is kind of going off the rails the way the series has been treating him. We've had situations where, you know, because of his situation with his grandmother and his father, um, and his own concerns about fatherhood where we've right. been able to sympathize with him. And that's good. We need those. We need to be able to sympathize with all of the companions. But I find that the writers have been treating Ryan in a, in a, in a less sympathetic way. As we go on, Ryan is the, at, at the moment, and I hope they change this, but at the moment, Ryan is clearly to my mind, the least likable of the characters. He complains yeah. all the time. He scorns yeah. other people regularly. He rejects Graham's offers to reach out and bond with him. Um, he's he's just Mr. Negative too much. And I hope really hope they give Ryan some more positive um, stuff and brighten up his character and make him happier. Yeah, I agree. Again, maybe the the confrontation, the, the coming confrontation with his father can be that moment for him to kind of right. deal with it and, and become Move a on. Yeah. happier person. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it, uh, they, they did have some nice things where he talked about um, his uh, uh, physical, uh, his physical challenges yeah. that he has. Yeah. Um, oh, the, uh, what, uh, it's not dyslexia. It's the other axiom Dys- thingy that he talked yeah. about. Dys- Dys- dysmorphia or something like that. But mm-hmm. um, it, 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 so the, he has an opportunity to talk about that and how that, that, that challenge has affected him. Almost a little too much. Like yeah. I'm like, all right, we get the point. We get jump dive in the, in, jump in the dive thing. in the shoot. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but so uh, so yeah, I agree with you. Uh, we need to have Ryan to lighten up a little bit and uh, and to kind of start enjoying the ride a little more. Um, so uh, I, I got to say about the bubble wrap, killer bubble wrap is not is not new to Doctor Who, as we no. recently talked about. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the Ark in space. We had a whole yes. monster made of bubble wrap, spray painted green. <laughs> <laughs> so I just felt like I, I, I was I was I was waiting a little bit for s- some reference to the killer bubble wrap of the Ark in and space. I, I but wonder maybe, if the fact that the bubble wrap blew up green was kind of a reference oh, to that. Oh, I bet you're oh, right. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. When it, when, it, when it blew up, it would blow up in a green puff of fire <laughs> that's right that's right and then we we get this um this this the moral at the end as the doctor you know kind of comes up with a solution which is kind of an odd solution just to blow everything up uh mm-hmm. to, to completely destroy every kablam delivery man uh with bubble wrap um and charlie you know f- for whatever reason refuses to follow them and ends up dying along with them. And for it. once, we this is the first time this season we've had the villain die. Yes. And I mean, we're this is like, what, episode eight? And, and we haven't had a villain die yet. People online have been noticing. It's like, what's with all the lack of consequences on this show? And, right. and finally, we have one. So well, we, I was we, happy we talked about, about that. that. Yeah, we, we, we've talked about that, too. There were, you know, like with the Rosa episode and a couple others where we said, you know, there's no consequences to the bad guy. Yeah. He just walks well, away. Yeah. Also, and 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 I thought it was nice. It was just a visual touch. After Charlie dies, we cut to a poster on the wall that has him in it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and the slogan on the poster is live your best life. And yeah. And it's like I, I, well, and it I it's out. like he really didn't do that. And they they, right. they showed the light sparking out. You know, mm-hmm. yes, the, his light was extinguished. I do have to. Speaking of consequences, uh, to kind of to kind of circle back to what we we're talking before about Kira and Dan dying. That that is one evidence that we could, we we actually complained about what Stephen Moffat is. Uh, that's different now with Chibnall is that people do die and mm-hmm. they stay dead. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, whereas, especially at the end of his run, Stephen Moffat had a trouble trouble with people dying and staying <laughs> dead, even like the good people, never mind the villains. So, uh, so at least I got to acknowledge that part. Um, there, there are consequences of people's people's actions have consequences. Um, we get the 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 moral is the system isn't wasn't the problem. It's how people who use the system that's the problem, which is a mm-hmm. which is not a bad moral to remember about a lot of things that we we hear about exactly. today. Um, it's not necessarily it's not sort of the technology that's the problem, but how people use it. Um, and of course, the name Kerblam is mm-hmm. is a, a cupid trait, of foreshadowing it, trait name. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, so th- that explosive was, uh, bubble wrap. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, did, were there any any other things uh, we we should mention about this episode? Uh... I, I had some some just some brief ones. Um, so during a lot of the episode, they they have the group loops attached to their legs, which are monitoring yes. devices, and this is something that's real. Um, you know, where there are businesses experimenting with employee tracking in this way, and mm-hmm. it's very dehumanizing. And, um, and so I didn't, I, I, I thought that was a nice bit of realism and a real source of concern because well, it is and, de- dehumanizing when you're under, as they put it, constant random monitoring. And, and Ryan kind of hints that, uh, the warehouse, the sporting goods warehouse that he worked at had something like that. Yeah. yeah I liked how he, um, <clears throat> he referred to his former area of employment as, the People's Republic of South Yorkshire, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and it's like okay, I'm, I, I can I I, I appreciate that. Um, yes, yeah. the, the I thought it was interesting that um, the moon they're on has the biggest Im- workforce in the galaxy, the biggest human workforce, and right. it's only ten thousand people. Yes, it's like that's yeah. tiny. Um, yes. it was interesting. We have this corporate happiness mandate which could have been played as just totally creepy, mm-hmm. but wasn't. It was a partial trope subversion where the corporate right. happiness stuff is a little creepy, but actually it's okay in some circumstances because the robots are nicer than the human managers. And yeah. actually the robots have some people skill. I, <laughs> there, there are points where, like where Yaz and Dan are talking mm-hmm. and, instead of working and more than once, the robots come up and and suggest they do their jobs, but they do it in a totally nice way. It's like, it, hey, guys, this sounds like a great conversation. Why don't you pick it up during the break period? Yeah, and exactly. That's, that's far more people skill than just like, get back to work. That's right out of some management manual, like for some giant corporation, like, you know, like Walmart or McDonald's, you know, or something like that. It's in the management training manual. Just the, the exact can, phrase. But, office but that's, um, that's, yeah, if you could get back to work, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but the way the robots do it is actually good management. I mean, yeah. yes, yeah. they are telling people to get back to work. But they're not doing it in the office space, clueless way, or right. the just mean boss get back to work way. Well, like well, uh, and they even s- subtly escalate it a little bit. You know, there's this like they stress the 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 they get a little more firm each time they have to tell them mm-hmm. to, yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah. that, that well, was pretty yeah, good they, writing. Yeah, it was yeah, it was interesting. You know, because of course Slade was just the stereotypical jerk manager. <laughs> yes, yeah. at least at first. Of course, <laughs> at he, first. Uh, and, and yeah. I like how when the two managers, once it's been revealed they're both good, they still don't know if they can trust each other. And right. Slade makes that point. Um, the auto, oh, the uh, Kerblam men in this episode are, they had kind of an <laughs> <Nice> auton. <laughs> well, yeah. th- that was the point I was going to make is they have a kind of auton vibe and also a kind of vibe like the robots from Smile. Right. And yes. so it's kind of a fusion of those two. That's true. Um, there is a line the doctor had when she's confronting the managers and saying, we need to escalate this to higher authority. And they're going, well, we are the higher authorities. And the doctor says, then you better be worthy of the jobs you're holding. Yes. And I, I can't put my finger on why I like that line so much, but it's she's not challenging that they're higher, that they're the highest authorities here. And she's not dissing them, but she's calling them to be what they need to be. Yeah, it's and, about executive, uh, like exec, corporate executives have a responsibility, not just to the shareholders or the owners, but to the employees that that report yep. to them. They have yeah. a they have a communal or societal uh, responsibility. I I like that a duty of care 
as yeah. the 12th Doctor would have put it. <laughs> um, I then like that Judy is the first one to rise to the challenge. And when the robot comes in to get uh, Charlie, it's action Judy, senior executive, <laughs> and she rips its head off right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was great. And then she ripped another one's head off. And I started thinking, aren't these robots a little fragile if you can just rip their heads off like that? And they're meant to <laughs> teleport all over the universe. Right, um, right. I can imagine a bunch of drunk guys in college ordering pizza and then ripping a robot's head off when it delivers the pizza <laughs> and playing <laughs> soccer with it. Um, sadly, I can imagine that. Yeah, yes, I, do. I, I, I liked it when uh, the doctor has booted up um, Twirly, and she and twir and she's she's framing th the job she needs Twirly to do in terms it can understand because yep. its yep. function is to deliver stuff. So okay, and you're upsell. gonna. And I'm so, you're going to deliver the information to us. And then it gets on board and can understand what it's supposed to do. Right. I yeah. like that. I also like when she tells it to, because it's trying to upsell her on stuff. And yeah. she says, look, cancel all these protocols. And it's like, even the upselling Upsell? ones? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As, as a, someone who absolutely hates upselling and does not respond to it well when confronted yeah. with it, I love that. Um, I then loved how when uh, when later when they're in an emergency situation and she goes to pick up Twirly, Twirly says, customers with your medical symptoms browse low blood pressure medicines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, finally, I uh, I really liked the bit where um, where they're thinking for a moment that the system is the problem. And 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 that it's trying to actively kill all of the customers. And Graham gets to say, Kablam's trying to kill their own customers. That's the worst business plan I've ever heard, <laughs> which, of course, it is. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Those are some some good moments. Some good, uh, good, good bits. Uh, Father Corey, any anything more on uh uh, just Uncle a couple, William. couple behind the scenes. Uh, looking at IMDb, we've got a couple of Broadchurch alums in this. Yeah. So the voice of Kerblam as, was played by Matthew Gravel, and he was uh, he was Joe Miller on Broadchurch. He was one oh. of the, one of the residents on Broadchurch. Um, yeah. But he also, for those of us who are are Catholic, uh, the Rona Downey uh, series, the Bible, and then the movie, The Son of God. He was doubting Thomas in that. Interesting. St. Thomas. And then Judy Maddox was played by Julie, and I'm sorry, I'm going to probably completely destroy her name, but Julie Hesman Hall. Uh, she was in season three only, Trish Witterman in season three right. of Broad Church. She was Trish. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy, we can't hear your voice. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, I knew I'd seen her before and I, and I like her much better in this than is Trish. Yeah. See, I, I her, haven't seen season her hair was yet, different. So. Yeah. yeah. Her hair is, uh, is, is grayer in this one. Uh, yeah. but yeah, that's, so, so a couple, I a couple was totally doing church. that. Where have I seen her before? Yeah. A couple of broad church alums. And I just yeah. want to say, since this is our hundredth episode, I want to thank father Roderick. He is the one who got this small yep. rolling a hundred episodes ago. I was going to mention yes. at the beginning. And I forgot. Uh, so Father Roderick, if you happen to listen to this, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate what you got started here, and hopefully you're proud of what we've got going. And one of our other uh, original panel members, Stephanie Week, who uh, who yes. dropped off there for a while, uh, we we also uh, had her on, and so I uh, just want to recognize yeah. Stephanie's contributions. Yes. Um, but, so by, there is. By, oh, by the ahead. way, one more behind the scenes thing. I looked up the writer on this episode. I forget his name at the moment. But if you look at his Wikipedia page, it talks about his involvement in this Doctor Who episode. And he's written a number of things that are apparently have won awards and stuff. But he said, my entire writing career was a scam to let me write for Doctor Who. And it finally paid off. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I think every uh, British actor and writer. Uh, their their ultimate uh, goal is to eventually end up on Doctor Who somehow, uh, and they're working on it. Uh, so uh, I did want to uh, mention one other thing I saw online that's Doctor Who related uh, behind the scenes thing. There was a great video that the Doctor Who uh, production put out a behind the scenes video of the um, the cookie situation or the biscuit situation on on the set, and uh -oh. they had the the Jody and uh, Tosin and Mandeep and Brad all talking about. 
like all of the cookies that are always available everywhere on set and the different kinds and everybody's eating them. And it's become a real problem for the crew and the, <laughs> and the cast because they're always eating all these cookies. And Brad, Brad Walsh has this great moment where he says, yeah, Tozen t- treats his body like a Greek temple. I treat mine like a Greek restaurant. <laughs> he eats all these cookies. Uh, and so uh, just, it's a, it's a funny little video. If you get a chance to, uh, to check that out online, uh, I'll see if I can find the link to it again. Um, but uh, if you go to the Doctor Who YouTube channel, I'm sure it's there. So, uh, okay, great. So uh, we also have some feedback. Uh, I don't want to forget the feedback. Um, we had some general feedback from John Scrivo, who uh, wrote um, an email. He said, uh, uh, I just became a patron. Thank you, John, for yes. becoming a patron. Yes. Uh, and you too can we become a that. patron by going to sqpn.com slash give. Thank you. And he says, I hope you get many more. We do too. Uh, I'm listening more weekly to Secrets of Doctor Who, Star Trek, Jimmy's Mysterious World. I'm almost I almost wish for a longer commute to work so I could listen more. <laughs> now that <laughs> that's a good compliment. That is that's the, yeah that's a big compliment because I know what a long commute to work is like. Uh, general impressions of the new season thirteen. Jodie Whittaker is very likable and the chemistry with the companions is great. Monsters are in need of improvement. Although my five year old daughter liked the short clip of the pating I showed her. I have uh, to say I've warmed to the, I've warmed to the pating over time. Yep. Okay. Yes. Uh, someone pointed out that the pating was like my uh, my my younger son when he was about three or four. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he asked, "What do you think of the starting age and first episode of Doctor Who should be for uh, you know for kids to introduce them to Doctor Who?" Oh, I, th- I think it depends on the kids. Yeah, um, I think, kids I have think really is... different tolerances for hide behind the yes. couch stuff. Yeah, my see, six, I, I, my seven year old would be much more tolerant than my eleven year old, for instance. See, it's I, I, you know, I think back for myself, I was probably about again. This is classic Who, not not modern Who, but classic Who. I was probably about eleven, twelve, thirteen. I don't think I was quite teens yet. Maybe ten, ten to twelve, somewhere in there is when I first was introduced to Doctor yeah. Who. So we, this could probably be a whole episode in itself. That discussion yeah. we've talked about this for Star Trek as well. Yeah. Um, but in general, I'd say classic who is probably more amenable to younger kids than new who. Mm-hmm. Although it depends. I, I, I it's certainly it's going to be slower paced than yes, than modern true. stuff. So it'll be less intense. The special effects will not be as realistic. Um, so given what modern which could kids, be helpful. Well, exactly. Yeah. Which modern kids w- could find helpful. It'll be less scary for them. Um, having said that, I forget how old I was, but I watched when Tom Baker was first on the air here. Mm. I was not, I, I don't know, I was somewhere between eight and 12, I would guess. Right. And my first, my first episode was giant robot with this King Kong like robot. And my second episode was Ark in space with the bubble wrap monster and people turning into wasps. <laughs> and so yes. that was pretty creepy. Yep. But so. it was fine. I was fine with it. So we'll 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 come back to this topic. I think well, we need to idea. think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he uh, adds uh, as a as a patron, I feel the need to say that I actually like dinosaurs on a spaceship. I hope you don't think less of me because of it. Part of uh, it can, might can, be because I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. He is a patron. We we degustibus to... non disputando mast. <laughs> exactly. Uh, part of it might be because I know nine year old me would have been all over a dinosaur sci fi adventure. Without all the goofy extra characteristics, it would admittedly have been better. I feel better now that I've made that confession. Father Corey, okay. can you give him Dr. Who Absolution? Absolution. Yeah. I, I think we can, we can do that. So. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, and, and the thing is, is that that's a good point. There is something for everyone. There are people who like the Moon Egg episode, and that's fine. I mean, it's okay for us to have different tastes and things. Yep. Different. Yes. You, you like a doctor that I don't, and I like a companion that you don't. It's okay. The, 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 that's very common these days in a lot of fandoms for people to get all freaked out that people have different tastes. It's okay. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just fine. Just just like what you like, and then there's something else for someone else. Yeah, and and we don't expect everybody to agree with us. We don't agree with each other. Exactly. Um, oh, definitely. So <laughs> you know, it 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 if 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 what we're saying is something that is entertaining and offers a different perspective. Great, but uh, we don't expect anybody to agree with us. This is just three guys talking about a sci-fi show. Exactly. So we, so thank you, John. We, we, uh, we still like you, even though you like dinosaurs on a spaceship. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and then uh, we have another piece of feedback from Andrew Wilson. Uh, he's uh, feedback on Demons of the Punjab. 
And he said, I've just listened to Secrets of Doctor Who 99, and I must say I'm fully impressed with your analysis of the episode. One question that was raised was the location of the filming of the episode. It was, in fact, Spain, as speculated. Right. You were right, uh, Dom. But this time, mainland Spain. Uh, the initial TARDIS landing was a shot across the Parque Nacional de Sierra Nevada in the mm. Granada province of Andalusia, southern wait, Spain. Wait, wait, wait. The Sierra Nevadas are here in California. Yeah, the originals that the oh. California ones are, are a copy of. They oh. oh. extend all the way across the ocean. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, apparently someone copied the Sierra Nevada and brought them to Pasted California. Pasted them over in California. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, one of the most beautiful locations, in my opinion, in Western Europe. Mm. And the filming brought this delightful location to life. Well, thank you, Andrew, uh, for for letting us know um, and putting another item on my bucket list of beautiful exactly. places in the world to go see. Uh, because uh, you're right, it was a, a a wonderful location, a beautiful uh, and spot, and the way they shot it with the use of light was really yes. impressive. Yep. Yes, very nice. All right, so uh, I think that's it from us. Uh, so, folks, what do you think of Kerblam? Uh, what did you think of the episode? What did you think of what we had to say about it? Let us know by going to sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and leave us some feedback feedback on this episode there. Or you can send us an email to Who at sqpn.com. You can find links to all our personal social media and websites on our show notes on sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time uh, when we'll be discussing the Witch Finders. Uh, until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me in sharing the Secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. Hey, glad to be here, and thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, if you want it, ker blam it. it. Right. This is going to be fun. This is Dom Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcast you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give.